I'm Eric Marcus, and this is Making Gay History. In this, our fourth season, we've been looking at the beginnings of the LGBTQ civil rights movement in the U.S. But the thing about beginnings is they're often contested. When it comes to questions of who started what when, one person's fact is another person's fiction. That's especially the case with oral histories, like the interviews I recorded three decades ago. Our ability to recall the past is surprisingly fallible and easily derailed by ego and emotion. We remember things as we think they happened, and often as we'd like for them to be remembered. We choose to remember some things and not others, and our individual impressions of the same event rarely match those of other witnesses to history. But what oral histories can do is they can take us inside how a person felt about a moment in history and how they perceive their place in that moment, and that matters. In this episode, we're going to hear different viewpoints from co-founders of a key early organization in the fight for LGBTQ rights in the U.S., one magazine, or one incorporated, or just one, depending upon who I asked. And I asked a lot of people about one and got very different answers. One Incorporated came into existence when then? October 15, 1952, in my home. There is a problem with some of the very inventive people that they come to the point where they feel they have to have invented everything. Dorr wasn't even at any of the first seven or eight meetings. I don't think he was around for the first year. Dorr never quits. He seizes control of any organization he works in and keeps it at his level. And Dorr has done so much which cannot be denied, really tremendous, so tremendously much that he doesn't need the credit for that. 100% wrong, all of them. That last voice you heard was the inimitable Dor Leg. He's the one who claimed one magazine started in his home. And you heard the magazine's first editor, Martin Block, say that wasn't so. In three interviews within the space of a week in August 1989, I heard various versions of one's origin story from three of the men who were there from the beginning, or near the beginning. A little later, we'll be hearing more from that first editor of One Magazine, Martin Block, as well as one of the first writers to work on the magazine, Jim Kepner. But let's start with Dor Legg, or William Dor Lambert Legg, who was born in Ann Arbor, Michigan in 1904 and claimed his ancestors came to America in the 17th century. Decades before he joined the fledgling gay rights movement, Dor earned a master's degree in landscape architecture and taught at the University of Michigan. By the time I meet Dorr in 1989, he's living on a large property in a residential neighborhood just west of downtown Los Angeles. Dorr shows me around the beautiful grounds, which he tells me are cared for by his lover of two decades. There's a grand mansion on the property which houses One Incorporated's 4,000 square foot library. Dorr takes me through row after row of storage boxes stacked on long tables, and he shows me drawers filled with little physique magazines, sort of gay porn before there was gay porn almost naked men in posing straps. There's a second smaller house, which is where Dor and his lover live. Both houses need a ton of work, but not Dor. He's trim and well-dressed in gray slacks and a pressed white shirt. I had no idea he was in his mid-80s until he told me. Dor Legg's story in the movement starts with a secret society in Los Angeles in the late 1940s. Dor and his then-lover, Marvin Edwards, had just moved to L.A. from Michigan as an interracial couple in search of a more accepting place to live. The first organization was, of course, the Knights of the Clocks. The Chicago organization of 1924 was incorporated and lasted about six weeks. <laughs> but the Knights kept on for years. Were you with your lover uh, by yes. the time you joined Knights of the Clocks? Uh, no. Uh, yes and no. Um, I met him in the East back when I was there, and I made a very professional analysis of every city of 100,000 in the United States on a professional city planning level. You did, did the research about a racially open city because... Uh, I wanted to find a place where we could be. Where the two of you could be. Yes. And I didn't want to come to L.A. I'd been here. I didn't like the place at all. I, I said, I used to tell people, it's just nothing but Detroit with palms, and, uh, which was uh, not a recommendation. No. <laughs> and, but on the other hand, I, every chart came out 
L.A. L.A. I thought, well, here it goes. Uh, how were you and your lover treated when you came here to Los Angeles as a mixed race, racial Oh, well, We had no problems of any kind. What year was that? 1949. Mm -hmm. There were restaurants you could go to. There were hotels that a mixed couple could stay in. Not many, but some. This was the most white open city in America in the 40s. A rip-roaring town. There was open male-to-male -male dancing to live music in gay bars in the city, and I've done it. Uh, and that was not happening in any other city in America to our knowledge. Uh, so that what we were able to, what the movement was able to do was to slip through the cracks and become strong enough to survive. Are you still in touch with anybody from Knights? Unfortunately, no. The founder of it, the one who got the idea. What was his name? His name was Bird. Merton oh, Bird. Merton Bird. Yes, right. he was the founder. And um, Merton is, is black, isn't he? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. He was the person with the concept. Mm -hmm. He was a very uh, enigmatic person in a way. Uh, friendly, outgoing, um, very handsome man, and sort of a, a, a quiet authority that everybody listened to him. He said to me, I had been thinking about an organization, and he described it, interracial, both male and female couples, and that was what it was about. Would you be interested? I said, well, I certainly would. I thought, my Lord, this is something different. When the Knights was founded, it was totally co-sexual, it was totally interracial, and it was actually the original gay community center, um, 20 years before there was one anywhere else in the country. It was simply a um, housing, legal aid, and all this, and it had to be. Was it, there an actual building where that... Uh, oh, no. No, no. 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 It was, it was small scale. Was it a telephone number, even? Uh, it, it got to be that I was the telephone number, uh, because I was one of the founders, and uh, so I did receive calls. But, but uh, there was a network of other people, uh, both black and white, in there. The people were uh, losing jobs and being fired and getting in jail and all this sort of thing. The meetings were, were uh, organized and formal and, and substantial. And the social meetings could be very large, up to 200 people, and very successful. Dances or? Oh yes, oh yes. It continued uh, holding its meetings and having social events for five or six years that I know of. And, but by this time, I was in the Mattershine, up to my ears, and I had no more that gotten into the Mattershine than we founded one. Right. And I was working in my field profession at the time. So, you know, there weren't that many days. One Incorporated came into existence when then? Uh, October 15, 1952, in my home. And at a Mattershine meeting, this meeting was at my home, and there was a, I had a big living room and dining room, and I had I don't know, 60, 70 people there. And this, was, this had already been, the idea had already been discussed before at other Never. meetings. Never. Never. The meeting was a pure Mattershine meeting, mm -hmm. and Martin Block was the chairman. So all these people came together. Well, the topic was, we were going to talk about police practices, uh, which by this time, L.A. was becoming very not an open city, as it had been. Scandals and changes had occurred. And... Um, and here was a vice cop, an ex-vice cop was the speaker, sat there telling all the dirt. A gay vice, ex-vice no, no. cop? Oh, a vice cop who was straight. A vice cop, period, mm -hmm. who was mad, mm -hmm. angry, um, and willing to tell all. They had walkie-talkies and bugs and all of this kind of thing. Um, guys walking on the beach with a very brief um, shorts on and a bug in there. Talk to somebody on the beach. Broadcast up to the car, parked up. All you had to do then was to say a word. The word would get people in jail. And so we just sat there and this man was telling all of this. And how uh, ambulance chasing 
uh, lawyers all over town who were getting rich off of these arrests uh, and in cahoots with the police and all of this kind of thing. And people were getting madder and madder and madder. And, and people were saying, people don't know this and they've got to be told. And um, Wasn't there a Johnny something or other? Who and, and Johnny, whatever his last name was. Um, Johnny Button. Johnny Button, mm -hmm. who we never saw again, um, spoke up and said, there should be a magazine. Everyone started talking at once. Martin said, I am not going to let this meeting be thrown off track. I'm the chairman and I'm going to keep it that way. Now, those of you who wish to do something, to talk this other thing, adjourn to another room, agree to meet at some other time, and let's have a little law and order here. And so we went into my kitchen, in the house where I was living then, and eight or ten of us said, well, are we interested? We said, yes. So all we did was set the date for the next meeting that we were yeah. going to meet and talk about. Martin doesn't remember you being at that meeting. God, it was in my house. <laughs> it was in my house. <laughs> See how interesting it is. Well, what's fascinating is that uh, the memories are, are so different. Fascinating, maybe. Frustrating, totally. Much as I love Dor's account of the vice cop with a conscience spilling the beans about microphones hidden in short shorts at the beach, it didn't match up with Martin Block's story, which he'd told me just three days before. Martin Block was the first editor of one magazine and a sometime anarchist who never took himself or the movement too seriously. Interview with Martin Block, Monday, August 21st, 1989, at the home of Martin Block in Los Angeles, California. Interviewer is Eric Marcus. Tape one, side one. How did one magazine come about? I had two friends one named Alvin Novak and Johnny Button. Uh, Johnny died a few years ago. And uh, they lived together in what was little more than a shack, sort of a rear house uh, in West Hollywood. And they were going to host one of the meetings, which were like every week or every second week. And were there a lot of people at these meetings? Oh, at that particular meeting, I think there were maybe 12 to 20 people because they had brought and invited some other people and we all brought others. To talk, this was to talk specifically about publication? No. Oh. And this was just one of the evenings where we talked on generally on general topics and Johnny finally said, you know, this whole thing is a lot of shit. We sit around here talking and talking. We don't do anything. Why don't we do something practical? Why don't we do something real? Why don't we, why don't we start a... Uh, a journal or a magazine or something. And in later years, uh, what's his name at one magazine? Dorleg. Dorleg. Dorleg has always said about the origins of one magazine, saying that I, of course, remember the first meeting at his house. Dor wasn't even at any of the first seven or eight meetings. I don't think he was around for the first year. And Dor has done so much which cannot be denied, really tremendous, so tremendously much for the, for the what movement there is, that he doesn't need the credit for that. It was all Johnny's doing. It was Johnny's push and excitement. And, and, and we all got really worked up and planned a whole thing and elected officers, and I was chosen editor, which I was for a number of issues. And... Uh, that was the start of one, and I think even the name one was chosen that night. The quotation from Carlyle, which I think is, there is a brotherhood that makes all men one, which is still used. What, what did you decide the purpose of There one? was a spirit uh -huh. that uh, brought the whole thing forth. And what was that spirit? Just the sense of actually doing something, the sense of creation and that we were doing it as a group. Mm -hmm. So Martin's account of one's founding didn't line up with Dor's memories, and Johnny Button wasn't around to ask anymore. Martin was light on detail, and as the interview went on, I often found myself staring at him, waiting for a response to one of my questions. 
That wasn't a problem with Jim Kepner, who was so detail-oriented that I imagined his brain was as jam-packed as the heaving shelves in his tumble-down cottage, which sat at the bottom of a hilly street in LA's Echo Park neighborhood. Jim wasn't quite as tumble-down as his surroundings, but it was clear to me that the focus for Jim was on his work, not on his personal appearance. By 1989, he had amassed a vast archive of movement-related materials, and he proudly showed me the pristine computer and printer in his home office that he was using to catalog his trove. Unlike Dorleg, who came from a privileged background, the infant Jim Kepner was found wrapped in newspaper under an oleander bush in Galveston, Texas in 1923 and adopted into an unhappy family. At the time one magazine was founded, Jim was working the milk carton line at the American Can Factory on the outskirts of Los Angeles. He got to Mattachine meetings whenever he could, despite the fact he didn't have a car and work nights. Interview with Jim Kepner, Saturday, August 26, 1989. Location is the home of Jim Kepner in Los Angeles, California. Interviewer is Eric Marcus. Tape one, side one. I had heard about the magazine. Mm -hmm. Dorr was running around peddling the magazine to the Mattachine discussion groups. So I began coming into the office frequently and talking to Dorr. This is by what, now what year? Uh, Probably starting sometime in the spring or summer of 53, the mm -hmm. first one's first year. I spoke about doing some work for the magazine and uh, discussing ideas for articles. So I began doing news reporting for one. What kinds of news items were there about homosexuals in, in the late 50s? Uh, well, that was a subject of much complaint from readers. Uh, the news was bad. <laughs> Uh, bars raided, guys murdered by someone they had picked up or uh, someone who saw them on the street and thought that they were queer. Public officials, chancellor of UC Santa Barbara or the mayor of Oswego, New York, arrested in public tea rooms. Nice, wholesome news like that. Mm -hmm. And some of the readers complained like hell and I explained several times that we did not have 500 reporters scattered around the world. We did have some readers who sent material to us. But uh, I depended on the uh, straight press. I was buying as many out-of-town newspapers as I could. And what I would catch was that uh, most papers you could read for a year without finding any gay news unless you learned how to read between the lines. How, what, what, how do you mean that? They may not mention the raid of a homosexual or queer bar. They had mentioned a, a house of ill repute. Mm -hmm. And if the several men are arrested and no women mentioned as present, you assume it's not a uh, whorehouse. In the article, they might mention that one, one man was dressed in a womanish manner. You, you looked for those words and then read the whole thing carefully to see if this sounds like it really is in this field, mm -hmm. then you go investigate. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Censorship questions generally, mm -hmm. because censorship hit us extra hard with a double standard. Mm -hmm. uh, anything that was uh, heterosexual uh, was considered obscene if it was extremely disgusting, provocative, sexually explicit, or had excessive use of Anglo-Saxon language or uh, uh, detailed descriptions of the mechanics. Anything that was uh, mentioned homosexuality was obscene simply if it did not point out how terribly disgusting and evil homosexuality was. Uh, no detail was permitted. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that was what got the magazine hooked. Right in the late 50s. The August 53 issue, which had the word homosexual marriage on the cover, had been seized and released. One printed an angry article saying one is not grateful to the post master for releasing it. And some people thought that the fact that the postmaster had released it was saying we were okay. And Dale Jennings was saying very definitely, this is nothing to be grateful for. This is bullshit. <laughs> uh, in uh, September, October uh, 54, had an uh, article with the law mailable material on the cover, an article by our lawyer explaining why the magazine was so tame. Readers were complaining and just saying, look, we cannot have stories, even though he said other, peri other, other periodicals could get, get away with it. 
we can't have stories in which two people meet in a bar, like one another, and leave together. The story has to clearly show that they went their separate ways. They may be interested, but so sorry. Uh, if two people touch, which is not advisable, it better be shoulder or above, and not erotic. Hi there, fella. <laughs> so uh, your story has uh, reflected that conservative. The stories reflected that. And every story went to the attorney, and once in a while, the editorial board would decide, this is a story we want. And we would argue with him, and he would say, well, you know, this is a real risk, but give it a try. Even after several years working on the magazine, after two or three years working on the magazine, I was still shy about picking up that magazine on a newsstand or other obviously gay magazines. Why? Why? I'm still shy about going to newsstands now, and I don't, I don't do it because it's... Uh, well, there was this sort of thing, you pick up five or six innocent magazines, and you sandwich them. Mm -hmm. You put the embarrassing ones in the bottom. So the news dealer starts to count them, ends up with the one you didn't want to show on top, then he goes to answer the phone or answer someone else's question, and you see a couple straight friends of yours coming down the street looking like they're coming toward the newsstand, and you sort of die. <laughs> 1957, uh, you already could not mail one through the mail. Uh, yes. Uh, well, first, an article in 53 had uh, suggested that everybody knows that uh, J. Edgar Hoover is sleeping with Clyde Tolson, his uh, close partner. Mm -hmm. They lived together and their mothers lived on either side of them. <laughs> FBI agents had showed up in one's office the next day wanting to know who, the, who wrote the article. And Dorr Dor can be as snootily non-communicative as anybody I've ever known. And uh, Dorr essentially told them to get the hell out. I'm not going to give you any information. Mm -hmm. uh, what are your names and numbers? That's all I'm interested in. Right. That's what you Were you there when the FBI showed up? No, I wasn't. They visited me a couple times, too. Mm -hmm and visited most members of the staff. I was perhaps foolishly not as abrasive with them. They asked me if a couple members of the uh, staff were communists, and I hooted and said that they were very conservative. I probably shouldn't have even told them that. Have they shown up at your home or at the one Here. office? Here at this house. Sat in that chair, one of them. <laughs> I did say that I had been a member of the Communist Party, that I had been kicked out for being gay, that I owed no thanks to the party for that, but I would not give information about individuals who were in the party whom I still respected. And asked you, were you frightened? I was nervous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was nervous, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a tense situation, a couple visits. What year was this? Uh, 54, 55, mm -hmm. 56. But it was uh, that, now, article, that article in one magazine that... that brought it on. Now, when it, through the Freedom of Information Act, we found a note from Hoover to Tolson, which I have a copy of, uh, saying we've got to get these bastards. And uh, a note to the post office urging them to check into one. From Hoover? Uh, from Hoover. The post office sees the next issue of the magazine. Which was which issue? It was the September, October of 54 which happened to have the article on the law of mailable material, which was a challenge to them. And up through the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, the courts found the magazine utterly obscene, uh, no redeeming social values, and utterly destructive of all social values. What did you do during those years that you could not mail one magazine? Oh, uh, for the time being, the seizure affected only the individual issue oh. until it was decided to be obscene or not obscene. I see. Uh, we were forbidden to mail out any further copies of that issue, and several other issues were held up for a month or two. Mm -hmm. uh, we began using extreme measures. Uh, each member of the staff, several times, would take a long drive. I would drive towards San Diego, Don would drive toward uh, Santa Barbara, 
uh, door would drive toward Bakersfield, someone else might drive toward Riverside to San Bernardino. And at each town we would go uh, off the highway, 10 blocks, find a mailbox, uh, put five or six copies in with nothing but our return address on the plain brown wrapper and uh, so on and mail these all over Southern California. No more than three or four in each mailing, mailbox. No more than 15 or 20 in any one town. We did this frequently until door was always too much of a skin flint. There were different enclosures in each issue depending on whether someone was getting a renewal notice, whether someone was a high class or low class member, they would get a few extra pages. So a lot of issues would be right at the, on the line as to whether they needed more postage. Well, the post office called me in one time uh, about, oh, five weeks after a particular mailing had gone out. And this was one that we had delivered all over Southern California. It was one of the risk stories that we had printed in that one. And we knew they were inspecting each issue for anything that they could hold it for. And they had virtually all of those issues on a couple flats down there. And I was required to weigh each one and to put on extra postage on about one out of ten. They <laughs> say, so we had mailed these all over Southern California. And I thought, oh shit. <laughs> and there they were all in one place. Uh, and then the Supreme Court, in a decision that was in bank but without opinion, without opinion. Was what, without, I'm sorry? Without in, opinion. In the, the whole court uh -huh. uh, cleared the magazine as the magazine is not obscene. And that sort of opened the floodgates. Because up to that time, the general assumption had been that material about homosexual, heterosexuality is obscene if it is specifically vulgar, terribly crude, uses filthy language, or is intimately descriptive of specific sexual acts. Material about homosexuality is obscene if it mentions a subject without specifying strongly that it is terrible, 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 terrible. There's a complete double standard mm -hmm. there. What did you... Then now what we also discovered from the Freedom of Information Act was that there was a written opinion which was not published, which the FBI had looked at. Oh dear. And that's it from Jim for now. While he answered that call about his archive, I reviewed the long list of topics that Jim had handed to me when I arrived and saw that we were only a couple of bullet points in, so I knew I'd be coming back for a second interview. Whatever the discrepancies between Dor Martin and Jim's recollections, a couple of things are clear. One was a pioneering organization that went beyond the Mattachine Society's secret meetings to take a public stand. And the Supreme Court case that Jim just talked about opened the floodgates for LGBTQ publications, a vital stepping stone towards building a national movement. One other thing, Jim Kepner questioned Dorleg's account of the Knights of the Clock, the organization Dor claimed predated the Mattachine Society. Jim told me that the Knights of the Clock was founded after the Mattachine Society, and it was a small ad hoc group, not the large dynamic organization of Dor's memory. One person who might have been able to corroborate one way or the other is Merton Bird, the mysterious founder Dor spoke of. But Merton seems to have disappeared in the 1960s, and I've never been able to find out more about him. If you have any leads, please write to me at eric at makinggayhistory.org. Dorleg died in 1994, Martin Block died in 1995, Jim Kepner died in 1997. While the three men may have disagreed about the origin story of one magazine and one incorporated, you can find their papers residing without conflict at the One National Gay and Lesbian Archives at the USC Libraries. We owe all of them a debt of gratitude for preserving our history at a time when few others thought that it mattered. Making Gay History is a team effort. 
Thank you to executive producer Sarah Burningham and the rest of the Making Gay History crew, producer Josh Gwynn, production coordinator Inga Detaya, social media producer Daniel Lorenko, photo editor Michael Green, and our guardian angel, Jenna Weiss-Berman. Our theme music was composed by Fritz Myers. The Making Gay History podcast is a co-production of Pineapple Street Media with assistance from the New York Public Library's Manuscripts and Archives Division and One Archives at the USC Libraries. Season four of this podcast has been made possible with funding from the Jonathan Logan Family Foundation, the Ford Foundation, the Calamus Foundation, and our listeners, like Eileen Smith. Thanks, Eileen. If you like your gay history in book form, HarperCollins recently republished the original edition of my book, Making Gay History, which is called Making History, in an ebook. Find it online at bn.com or wherever you buy your ebooks. And while you're shopping, head to makinggayhistory.com and click on the Merchandise tab to find Making Gay History t-shirts, tank tops, hoodies, tote bags, and mugs. They make perfect holiday gifts, and you'll be supporting the show. Win-win. Stay in touch with Making Gay History by signing up for our newsletter at makinggayhistory.com. That's where you'll also find previous episodes, archival photos, full transcripts, and additional information on each of the people we feature. So long, until next time.